Tonight, a warning from allergy doctors for parents who rely on Benadryl. We really know that this is a drug that has significant risk. What they found, what they say you should do, and why now? British Columbia cracks down on vaping. Also tonight, calls for change again after another U.S. school shooting. And Justin Trudeau's parade of meetings with federal leaders continues. I have no interest in, in blindly working with the Liberals. So how will the Prime Minister govern in a minority? Rosie is here with At Issue. This is The National. Doctors have been trying to get through to parents for years to warn them away from a drug you may have at home right now. Benadryl, a popular antihistamine, used to treat everything from hives to cold symptoms. But it also comes with potentially serious side effects. Doctors say taking too much can be very dangerous, even deadly. And children are especially vulnerable. Canadian allergists say it's time to act. And as Nicole Ireland tells us, they want Health Canada to get involved. When his five-year-old son gets rashes or hives, Frank Nelson usually reaches for liquid Benadryl. Now that he's heard the warnings, that's going to stop. We're always looking out for the safety of our children, and so I would definitely start using a different product. Old habits are hard to break. Benadryl was first introduced in the 1940s. Drugs weren't subjected to the same licensing standards they are now. Children's Benadryl effectively relieves... And it's still advertised as providing quick and effective relief of allergy symptoms even though it can have dangerous side effects, especially for children. There's no shade of gray here. We really know that this is a drug that has significant risk. Benadryl's active ingredient, diphenhydramine, causes drowsiness and sedation. That can impair children's cognitive function. If kids are given too much of it, they can have difficulty breathing and even overdose. I don't think that um, parents appreciate the risk of this for younger children who can't speak to how sedated they feel. Allergists say Benadryl should no longer be an over-the-counter drug. A move Toronto pharmacist Stacey D'Angelo would applaud. Basically what this is doing is forcing an intervention with the pharmacist. Um, so it's still accessible, you don't actually need a prescription, it's just kept behind the counter. So if you do need it for whatever reason, um, you just need to have that uh, discussion with the pharmacist to make sure it's appropriate for you and that you're aware of the risks. Benadryl's manufacturer, Johnson & Johnson, insists that the product is safe if used as directed. In a statement, the company says Benadryl products have been trusted by doctors and moms for more than 60 years. Health Canada says it's reviewing the concerns raised by doctors. In the meantime, allergists want people to realize there are plenty of safer antihistamines, such as Claritin, Reactin, or Arius, for allergy relief. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. The B.C. government is taking action on vaping, following three cases of lung illness in the province and thousands more in the United States. Starting next year, vape products will have to be in plain packaging with health warnings, just like cigarettes, and advertising will be banned in places where you'll tend to find younger people, like bus shelters and parks. Flavors will not be banned, but they'll only be available at age-restricted shops. The government also plans to raise the sales tax on vape products from 7 to 20 percent. A part of the goal, you've probably figured out, is to make vaping less attractive to young people. But as Tina Lovegreen tells us, teens themselves aren't sure it'll work. It's hard to miss the big vape clouds outside this East Vancouver school. It's a daily occurrence during lunch break. Students as young as 15 taking part. It's the flavor, it's the head rush, it's the the social factor of it. And it's that social factor that gets youth hooked on vapes. As a kid, you just see everybody else trying and you're like, I want to try that. And then you get a nice head rush and you're like, I like that feeling. And then you just keep trying it. Even though these students are underage, they say it's easy to get their hands on the product. And where do you guys get your vapes from? Local uh, shops. Store. Yeah, some because some stores, they sell to minors. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. The province wants the sale of flavored vapes only in age-restricted shops like this one. I welcome those changes as far as getting it out of the convenience stores and things like that, because I don't think they really check ID and they don't really do what the law is supposed to be telling them to do. But he's relieved there's no outright ban on flavored vapes, because he says that would mean the end of business. There's nothing else to sell. It would just definitely 
crippled industry. They just wanted a teen hit at this point. Grade 12 student Isabel Casey says her high school cracked down on vaping by closing the bathrooms for weeks. How effective was that? Not effective at all. <laughs> Awful. Better, she says, to reach kids before they even start. Educating like grade six, so they know at a very young age the health concerns because we never got that. We went into like grade nine and it was like, wow, this brand new product, why don't we try it? And then you're hooked. Education is a big part of it. It's, yeah, it's a pretty popular thing. Especially since not all students believe vaping is that bad for you. Not really, no, not as people are as much as people are making it to seem. But you know, it definitely has some health hazards to it, but it's all about managing it yourself, you know. The government seems to agree. Part of its plan is to have young people lead a new social media campaign, hoping it will apply a different kind of peer pressure. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. To California now, where a terrible but familiar story played out just north of Los Angeles. A shooter in a high school. Police say a student marked his 16th birthday by opening fire on his classmates. Two of them are dead, three others wounded, and the shooter also in hospital clinging to life. Kim Brunhuber now with how it all unfolded. Minutes after parents dropped their kids off at school, the news came. News every parent in America has now learned to dread. A shooter at their school. Not hearing from your child, it's the most terrifying thing in the whole world. Fearing the gunman was still at large, police locked the area down. Students and nearby residents were told to shelter in place. I wasn't expecting this today. That I was, I never got to say goodbye to my parents this morning. Inside the school, police say they found six students who'd been shot. One of them, the shooter himself, a 16-year-old student at the school. Today is his birthday. Police found an empty 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. The shooter used the last bullet on himself. Detectives have reviewed the video at the scene, which clearly show the su subject in the quad withdraw a handgun from his backpack, shoot and wound five people, and then shoot himself in the head. These students tell me they knew the shooter. Very quiet individual, didn't uh, cause too much trouble or do any damage, always minded his own business. Just a few weeks ago, students here went through a live shooter drill, but they say nothing prepared them for hearing those pops and knowing that this time it was for real. Even though you're prepared for it, it doesn't, you can't really be prepared for it. Senator from Connecticut. Incredibly today on Capitol Hill, Senator Richard Blumenthal was speaking about gun violence when an aide handed him a piece of paper. As I speak, on the floor right now, there is a school shooting. How can we turn the other way? There's the whole, don't take my guns, but after you're in something like this, don't take my life. Santa Clarita, the latest American community to grapple with questions that have no answers. In the anguished words of one student, what kind of world is this? Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Santa Clarita, California. A former TV star himself, Donald Trump, watches ratings very closely. And we've now learned the first public impeachment hearing against him was a ratings hit. Nearly 14 million people tuned in. That's more than for the final episode of Game of Thrones. Susan Ormiston shows us where Democrats are planning to take things next. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Democrats are, are sharpening their case. With... What I am saying, uh, that what is, uh, the president has admitted to and says it's perfect, I said it's perfectly wrong. It's bribery. Bribing a government is more digestible language, a strategy. Bribery, extortion and bribery. Bribe an ally. Pelosi says it's defensible. The bribe is to grant or withhold military assistance in return for a public statement of a, uh, a, of a fake investigation into uh, the, the elections. So that's a, that's bribery. President Trump keeping a healthy distance from cameras today has drummed quid pro quo into submission. I said no quid pro quo. It's been hurled about so often, denied so frequently, its impact diluted. Time for plain language, say some Americans. I think we need to stop using words like quid pro quo. We're letting the president set the dialogue instead of saying, no, this is bribery and extortion. But a day after the first public testimony, Republicans are trying to dull any damage. I'm really over with this. This whole thing is a joke. I am not persuaded by the quid pro quo 
pro quo argument. He tells Sunderland there's no quid pro. Nothing happened here. Perhaps a little early to be over anything. At least eight more officials will testify here in public in the next week, beginning tomorrow, with the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, abruptly dismissed, she says, after a smear campaign by the president's allies. And as a parade of witnesses adds to the impeachment puzzle, Democrats privately concede they may not change a lot of minds. They are trying. This is about patriotism. It's not about politics, Democrats, Republicans. It's not about poli anything political. Nothing political? That seems like a stretch. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Now, tomorrow, we're likely to hear more about the Trump administration's diplomacy in Ukraine. As Susan mentioned, the former U.S. ambassador to that country will testify. That should begin around 9 a.m. Eastern. Also, behind closed doors, a diplomatic aide mentioned in testimony yesterday will speak about a call he overheard in it. The U.S. president is said to have asked directly about the status of investigations in Ukraine. Okay, back to Canada now, where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is figuring out how he'll govern without the clout of a majority. Today, he met with a leader who thinks his party could be the key to liberal survival. David Cochran tells us what the NDP's Jagmeet Singh wants in return. He's by no means the Prime Minister's only option, but Jagmeet Singh is the only option that is both progressive and federalist. If they want to pass a bill, they need to work with the party. If they want to pass a bill that's progressive, that puts in place something that's national, that's going to benefit all Canadians, they have to work with New Democrats. It's Singh's attempt to distinguish his party from the Bloc Québécois, a progressive option that might work with the Liberals, but also a separatist one that only cares about Quebec. I still believe that Quebec will do better when it becomes a country. So I'm not the one that will fight to have a nice, beautiful and united Canada. They're not a national party. If they want to do something that's national, if they want to develop something that's going to benefit all Canadians, it's us. So he's leveraging his 24 seats for all they are worth. After all, his party is broke, he lost a third of his caucus, but Singh still has to project a position of strength. I have no interest in in blindly working with the Liberals. If they want to deliver on real things that help Canadians out, yes, absolutely, we're going to work together. In his meeting, Singh listed pharmacare, dental care, and compensation for Indigenous children as conditions for support. It continues a week of face-to-face -face meetings, during which the leaders who lost the election sought concessions from the leader who won it. You can expect a lot of grandstanding as all the parties try to flex their muscles in this new minority parliament, but so much of it is just for show. The reality is that the only party with the money to run a quick election campaign would be the Conservatives, and they haven't even decided if they're going to keep their leader. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And plenty more politics here to dig into. What is the Prime Minister's strategy here, and who could have the most influence? Rosie's here in about 20 minutes' time with At Issue. Okay, you may not be familiar with Canada's best rugby team, but the Toronto Wolf Pack hopes a splashy move will change that. They're paying big bucks to a New Zealand superstar. And if you haven't heard the name Sonny Bill Williams, well, just think of him as the sports LeBron James. Lisa Shing has that story. If you're anything of a rugby fan, you'll know the name Sonny Bill Williams. A force on the field in different leagues and types of rugby and in the boxing ring. And today in the UK, the official announcement he's coming to play for the Toronto Wolfpack, a team that recently got promoted to the top tier Super League. I'm really grateful and blessed for this opportunity. What better, I guess, pressure environment would you want to test yourself? That pressure environment he's talking about is because Toronto is already jam-packed with pro sports. Not only do we have the NBA champion Raptors, the Leafs and Blue Jays, there's Toronto FC and the Argonauts too. And rugby isn't as well known around here. For Williams, that's part of the appeal. How amazing would it be if, if, if rugby league kicks off and in uh, North America. Since 2017, the Toronto Wolfpack has been steadily making inroads, hoping to draw people in with a sport that's long been the craze of nations like England, Australia, and New Zealand, where Williams played with the legendary All Blacks, with whom he's won two World Cups. If we can succeed, it's going to open up avenues for, for young Polynesian boys, young uh, English lads that could provide for themselves and their family in, a, in another country.
The Wolfpack's head coach is hoping to make use of Williams's star power. So what Toronto are doing is making people around the world take note of Super League. Those stands behind us were totally full. This sports reporter has been following the rise of the Toronto Wolfpack since its inception two years ago and says interest in the sport is rapidly growing in the city and adding Williams to the roster will elevate Toronto's name internationally. You get that name, people are going to suddenly want to tune in at whatever time it is in their own countries to see Sonny Bill Williams play. Williams will start the season with the Wolfpack in England early next year before coming to play on this field in April when it's warmer. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. And we have more news ahead tonight, including one family's warning about organ donations. They say they didn't know their father wanted to donate before his death, and they're not alone. We look at the push to change the system. And later, a CBC Marketplace investigation into coconut oil. Is it as healthy as people think? And a legendary hockey player comes to the defense of Don Cherry. Bobby Orr on Cherry's comments and his firing. We're back in two minutes. More than a third of Quebec families refused to donate their loved one's organs, even when that person had made it clear they wished to do so. Leah Hendry looks at one family's experience and a call to change the system. Marie-José Prévost says her father, Paul, was full of life. So though he was 81, it came as a shock when he suffered a massive stroke. Sûr il Doctors said it would be risky to operate. He'd likely remain paralyzed and unable to speak. A doctor raised the possibility of organ donation. But Prévost said it wasn't clear what needed to happen or when. Feeling unsupported and unprepared, they ultimately refused to consent. According to Transplant Quebec, there were only 164 donors last year. A recently tabled private member's bill on presumed consent is meant to change that. If passed, everyone would be an automatic donor unless they opt out. This past spring, Nova Scotia became the first province to adopt similar rules. But it's not going to be the magic bullet on its own. Transplant Quebec's medical director of transplantation says for a system of presumed consent to work, Quebec needs better infrastructure. He says a recent government promise to increase the number of donation physicians from 10 to 32 is a good first step. This network I'm sure that in their institutions there's um, uh, a set way of recognizing organ donors and making sure that organ donation opportunities are not missed. He'd also like Quebec to follow Ontario's lead. Designated hospitals there have to flag every imminent patient death to Ontario's organ and tissue donation agency. This lets them identify eligible donors and approach families for consent in a timely manner. Prevost told her children she wants to be a donor and wishes her father had done the same. She later learned he had consented to organ donation on the back of his health insurance card, but he'd never discussed it with them. Which is a shame, she said, because he could have saved lives. Leah Hendry, CBC News, Montreal. Now we found that across Canada, next of kin retain the right to block a family member's donation. Even in Nova Scotia, where presumed consent is the law, families continue to be consulted. Manitoba told us that the vast majority of families allow donations to proceed so long as they've been told of their relatives' wishes. But when the intent wasn't known, more than half blocked the donation. Okay, let's go to our national newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is watching stories from across Canada. And Andrew, let's begin in Toronto where police are looking for two suspects in connection to a violent robbery that sent two people to hospital, one in serious condition. Heavily armed police responded after reports of the shooting at a moving company in the northern part of the city. Police say this was targeted. We came out and there was a bunch of fire departments and police, ETF and canine units came. A man and woman uh, were shot and taken to hospital. The specific target of the thieves still unclear, but police say they are, quote, aggressively investigating this. Police in Alberta have made what they believe is the biggest seizure of fentanyl in Canada, and they've arrested a man they believe was responsible for a massive drug operation. Project Coyote was a two-year investigation that resulted in the seizure of over $50 million worth of drugs. 
The complex investigation involved Alberta's integrated police team and the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. They say a 53-year-old man, leader of a countrywide drug organization, was arrested along with six others. Just over a year after its legalization, New Brunswick's government is moving to hand over sales of recreational cannabis to the private sector. This was the best way to stop losing money is what we saw and stop, uh, stop the bleeding. The province wants to ditch Cannabis NB as early as next year and replace it with a single private operator. The Provincial Crown Corporation has been a money loser to the tune of more than $16 million. Interested parties have until January to submit their proposals. And hockey legend Bobby Orr is publicly supporting Don Cherry. I know Grapes better than anybody. He's not a bigot and he's not a racist. Uh, what they've done to him up there uh, is, is just disgraceful. It really is. Or on a Boston radio station today, coming to the defense of the 85-year-old who was fired after nearly 40 years on Hockey Night in Canada. Orr was once coached by Cherry. He also described him as a generous, caring guy. On Saturday, the Coach's Corner host appeared to single out immigrants for not wearing poppies to honor veterans. We'll have the latest on the flooding in Venice when we look at international stories. That's in 20 minutes. And time for a quick break. When we come back, a CBC Marketplace investigation puts coconut oil to the test. Is it really as healthy as advertised? Plus, The story behind this emotional airport reunion. A powerful moment for a Syrian refugee and a heartbroken family in Regina. Coconut oil has become a pantry staple. People bake with it, cook with it. Some people just eat it by the spoonful. But is it as healthy as we think? This week, Marketplace dives into that question, and Asha Tomlinson shows us what they found. Hit the internet, and this is what you get. Eating coconut oil will give you a better metabolism. This does help you lose weight. Seems like everyone's jumping on the coconut oil bandwagon. I put two teaspoons of coconut oil in my coffee every morning, and they think that I'm nuts. And it didn't take long to find believers at this Toronto grocery store. I'm from the Caribbean, so we use a lot of the coconut oil. It's good for your hair, it's good for your skin, it's good for cooking, it's good for everything. But is it as good for us as we think? We found the researcher who unknowingly set off this trend in the first place. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Marie-Pierre St. Ange did a study back in 2003 on MCT oil, which stands for medium chain triglycerides. MCT is a subcomponent of coconut oil, and only 15% of coconut oil is MCT. And her conclusion? That oil had a small impact on weight loss, but coconut oil was never researched. You weren't testing coconut oil? Not at all. We were testing MCT oil. It's very purified form. It's often picked up as being um, a study that promotes coconut oil, but in fact, there are completely different. That didn't stop the health craze from exploding. So we did a food fact check. One tablespoon of coconut oil has 13 grams of saturated fat in it. Yuck. That's like 90% saturated fat. That's the opposite of healthy. Dietitian Andrea Miller helps separate fat from fiction. Our heart health guidelines are that we should be keeping the total saturated fat content of our diet down around 10%. So if we're putting coconut oil in our coffee or spreading it on our toast, chances are we're way overstretching that saturated fat recommendation. The coconut oil companies in our story say new science shows the saturated fat in coconut oil doesn't have the same negative health effects as the kind in animal fats like lard and butter. They say it has health benefits. But experts we talk to say there's not enough evidence to support that. And Health Canada recommends limiting all saturated fat, including coconut oil, because of its link to heart disease and stroke. Asha Tomlinson, CBC News, Toronto. And Marketplace will have a lot more food fact-checking tomorrow night. You can catch the full investigation on CBC Television starting at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland. Okay, the Nationals back in two minutes. Rosie is next with At Issue. After his meetings with the opposition this week, we look at the Prime Minister's strategy heading into a minority government. Andrew, Shachi Curl, and Aaron Wary are here after the break.
But first, here's Adrian with a preview of a national interview you'll see here next week. Take a look. Well, someone is about to have a big birthday, and maybe Margaret Atwood has already had her gift. Her book, The Testaments, has broken a Canadian publishing record. This is more than a book release. This is a cultural moment. The soon-to-be 80-year-old co-won the Man Booker Prize. And there is a project for so deep into the future, no one alive will ever get to see what it is. Could you throw a girl a bone? In nope. terms of what it's about? No, 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 you have to swear to secrecy. There is a lot to talk about, and so sitting down in the place that holds so many of her treasured notes just seemed the right thing to do. That's in the days to come on The National. been a week of meetings on Parliament Hill between the Prime Minister and opposition leaders. But after the photo ops and closed door meetings, not everyone left with the same message. It's up to Justin Trudeau to find common ground uh, to, to, to make this Parliament last. What has been discussed suggests uh, strongly that a lot of the issues will be consensual. I have no interest in, in blindly working with the Liberals. So how are the leaders playing their cards and what does this mean for the upcoming throne speech? It is Thursday, so time to bring in At Issue. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight. Shati Curl is in Vancouver, and Aaron Wary is here in Ottawa with me tonight. Good to see you all. So we saw those meetings take place. I should point out there's one more tomorrow with Elizabeth May. Um, at this stage, Andrew, do you think that the Prime Minister has sent the right signals about his intent going into uh, the, the parliamentary session, which we now know will start on December 5th? Uh, it depends what you mean by the right signals. I, <laughs> Cooperative. I, Cooperative I, signals. Uh, not particularly, no. Uh, I don't think anybody has. I think all of this has been very performative. Uh, people have to be seen to be talking to one another. But nobody really has much of an incentive at this point to make much in the way of move, conciliatory moves. Uh, not the premiers in the West who are uh, playing to their gallery. Not uh, the opposition parties who have different uh, constituencies also to attend to. And certainly not the prime minister who knows that nobody really wants an election anytime soon uh, and I don't think is going to be particularly in a mood to, to make any extravagant concessions. He's got to himself uh, play to his, the broader gallery of the public. He can't look like he's just uh, saying my way or the highway, but as long as he does the right um, uh, politesse and the right performances, uh, I think he's in a relatively strong position. So, uh, Shachi, do you think that, that opposition leaders coming out and sort of going through their laundry list of things that they need to see or want to see, does that have any, does that carry any weight at all, should it? Well, it really depends on how skillfully the Prime Minister actually handles all of these machinations. <laughs> Who knows how that's going to go, but, uh, you know, he is in the catbird seat because he gets to go to each of these opposition leaders, each of the premiers, and sort of say, may I take your order? What can I do for you? <laughs> and be mindful of the fact that this is also a lot of inside the beltway or inside baseball for people who are watching it from afar. It's a lot of meetings to follow, a lot of, of scrums coming out of it to keep track of. What Canadians are looking for are their priorities. Okay, so what are those priorities? They want to see movement on tax cuts. That's something that voters across the board said yes to. They want to see some improvement on health care. So, you know, stay tuned for more probably on a pharmacare plan of some point or some kind. And then you will have enough voters on both sides, two-thirds who said yes to a carbon tax and two-thirds who voted liberal and, and conservative who said yes on pipeline matters to want to see some movement on that. So so there is the war of words and, and there is the leaders trying to, to sort of jockey for position here. But ultimately, I think Trudeau knows if he doesn't screw this up, he's got enough room to maneuver on those priority measures. Yeah, and that, that's what it seems to me too, Aaron, that there's a lot of opportunity here to reach, to cut deals with various people. Yeah, I mean, we're going to do this dance uh, now for as long as this parliament lasts where <laughs> opposition leaders come out and we ask them what their demands are. and. They say what their demands are, and then we ask them what, what, whether they're ready to force an election if they, their demands aren't met, and they'll waffle and we'll get mad. And this will go on for uh, <laughs> at least until the next Excellent. election. Uh, but I do, think there is, I do think there is a slight convergence here of interests, right? The Bloc and the NDP are looking to sort of reestablish themselves as important and influential forces in Ottawa. The Prime Minister uh, and his government, he wants to show that he can govern well, that he can work with other parties. He wants to, to build up a record that he can take into the next election. You would think that there'd be some way for those three sides to work together 
you know, it, it's going to be messy, but there should be some way for these guys to, to come together at some point to move an agenda forward. Uh, there will be, you know, the inevitable jockeying for who gets to take credit for every accomplishment. Uh, and it, at some yeah. point, that will break down. But you would think at this point, at least in the short term, you know, again, no one wants an election, and there is this, this, there's a shared mutual interest in sort of making this parliament work and at least a, for a little while. And, and Rosie, there is... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Chachi, and then yeah, there, there's there's also one more constraint that this government, however it works, is freed from, and that's the fact that again you saw a significant number of people who opted for this particular configuration of Parliament saying we're not worried about spending. So this could be a very yeah. spendy time uh, as the Prime Minister tries to get things done, it's sort of reminiscent of what his his dad did in that 72 to 74 minority Parliament, and that was a time of big spending too. So we'll see okay. if that happens. Andrew. Yeah. As with the, the Stephen Harper minority, the, the, the strength of the government's position is you need all three party leaders to pull the lever at the same time to force an yeah. election, all three opposition party leaders. Uh, so what that means is this isn't just a game of chicken between the government and the opposition. It's a four-way game of chicken. It's all the opposition leaders playing chicken with each other, saying, well, I'm going to bring the government down. I'm going to vote against this bill and trying to force the other ones to be seen to be the ones propping the government up. So we'll see a lot of that kind of jockeying as well, of, of people announcing ahead of time uh, that they're going to vote against this or that and putting the pressure on on one of the other parties. Oh man, it's going to be so interesting. There is a reason journalists like minority governments. Okay, I want to shift to uh, that exchange between Yves-Francois Blanchet and then the response from Kenny this week because it just sort of it feeds more into the, our conversations about Western alienation or alienation of uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan because some people get mad at me in BC when I say that. Anyway, here's what, uh, here's what uh, Blanchet had to say on Jason Kenny. They were attempting to create a green state in Western Canada. I might be tempted to help them. If they are trying to create an oil state in Western Canada, they cannot expect any help from us. If you are so opposed to the energy that we produced in Alberta, then why are you so keen on taking the money generated by the oil field workers in this province and across Western Canada? Okay, so Aaron, did, did that uh, back and forth surprise you at all? And what, what should we make of how, how that's going to sort of define the country, at least in the short term? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we should be necessarily surprised that the leader of the Bloc Québécois is not particularly worried about the resources in Alberta and whether or not they can get to market. Uh, and I also, I guess we also shouldn't be surprised that Jason Kenney and, and Andrew Scheer are jumping on this as an opportunity to sort of stick up for the West, to stick up for the resource sector, to stick up for uh, their own uh, constituents, their own base. Uh, I think it is, you know, it is indicative of we're going to hear more of this, I'm sure. Uh, this, you know, this... This discussion we've been having, especially over the last few weeks, about Western alienation in the resource sector isn't going to go away magically. I think if there is a, is a sort of a larger issue here, it's, it's what Trudeau is going to have to do in terms of balancing out, as we just said, working with the NDP, working with the Bloc, working on climate issues, while at the same time trying to work with premiers or at least uh, show that he is trying to address Western alienation. He can't. You know, he can't just pick one or the other. He has to somehow try to do both. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has to, I guess, hope that at, there's no point where, uh, you know, working with one, working with uh, the bloc of the NDP in, in the House to get legislation passed, it, you know, expressly goes against, the, against uh, Western interests and puts him in a, in a position where it seems like he's picking sides. And, and this, of course, happened the same week that Scott Moe finally got his meeting with the Prime Minister, and he was not thrilled with the outcome of that either. Sachi. So the, the rhetoric that you're hearing from Jason Kenney and Scott Moe isn't just about premiers trying to be lightning rods and, and rile up you know, their bases at home for political expediency. Sure, there's a part of that, but it's also very much based in the fact that there is tremendous anxiety and worry coming out of those two provinces. You know, we look at economic confidence. The number of people in those two provinces who are worried about someone losing a job in their household in the coming months is more than two times the national average. So mm -hmm. this is coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, there will have to be a point beyond the political machinations that we've talked about where all of these leaders are going to have to 
get, you know, check themselves, get a grip and say, well, what are we doing in the interests of the nation as a whole? The, the Jason Kennys of the world, in the same way that the Francois Legault's of the world, run the risk of whipping up too much nationalist or provincialist sentiment in their provinces, whereby they unleash something, and we're starting to perhaps see the beginnings of that in Alberta and Saskatchewan with the Wexit movement, that they may not be able to put back, they won't be able to put that genie back in the bottle later, and so they've got to now be a little bit more focused on solutions as well and it's going to take two to tango on that front we need to see the change in tone from justin trudeau but we also need to see a willingness to work Although from, Jason, from those Ken, yeah, Jason Kenney did put out sort of a roadmap of solutions. I mean, you can That's right. think that they're not possible or, or not like them, but he did put forward some of the things he would look at, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't know better, I would say Blanchet was being deliberately uh, provocative. I mean, he not only <laughs> not only saying, yeah, we'll take the equalization money, but we're not going to take the pipelines as if Quebec actually has any authority to say so. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's simply a political clout. But also on top of that, I think Vashi Capellos on your uh, politics and pa power and politics panel was saying, uh, well, you know, why are you so averse to pipelines given Qu Quebec is getting oil by pipeline from Alberta now, 44% of its needs? Mm -hmm. and his answer was basically, well, we've, you know, we have enough for our purposes, so we're, therefore we're not going to be cooperative any further. So he's really uh, being as, as antagonistic and as annoying as he possibly can, and you could absolutely forgive Albertans for being outraged by that. I guess I hope that the response in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan is not going to be, as I fear it may, that the answer to all this is to be as inward looking and, and as antagonistic as Quebec's political class has been, to, to use this occasion to, as premiers always do, grab for more money and powers for themselves, to turn inward, to stop trying to think about what's good for the country as a whole. There's a lot of rhetoric going out right now that's basically saying to people, let's just put up walls, let's just uh, uh, take care of our own. And if everybody in the country does that, then we're all going to be diminished. Okay. On that uh, not very happy <laughs> note, but something to think about, as always, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll thank you all and let you go. Thanks, everybody. Before we go, though, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're talking about cabinet speculation ahead of next week's swearing in. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. And Ian is back in two minutes with more news from around the world, plus a Saskatchewan family finds hope amid grief. How the tragic death of their brother led to the reunion of a Syrian refugee with his family. But first, in case you missed it, the trial of Roger Stone is almost over. He's an ally of Donald Trump, facing charges related to Robert Mueller's probe. To Mueller, Stone was a link between the Trump campaign and Russia's efforts to influence the 2016 election. And this trial revealed why. Stone was the Trump campaign's access point to WikiLeaks, which released Democratic emails stolen by Russia. He seemed to have exclusive knowledge of the leaks months before they happened. As Stone said in one email, Trump can still win. I know how to win, but it ain't pretty. Campaign aide Rick Gates said the emails were seen as a gift and testimony described how Stone's tips, some delivered to Trump directly, were worked into the campaign. WikiLeaks, I love WikiLeaks. It's WikiLeaks is like a treasure trove. Last fall, Trump told the Mueller inquiry he couldn't recall such conversations with Stone and more recently said, uh, I know nothing about WikiLeaks. It's not my thing. For his part, Stone denies being a conduit to WikiLeaks. The jury has yet to give its verdict. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, day two of the public Trump impeachment hearings. We're digging into why these hearings are so important and what we can learn from Nixon and Clinton. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the National Newsroom in Vancouver. After days of destructive floods, Italy's government has declared a state of emergency in Venice. The worst flooding in more than 50 years has put more than 80% of the city under water when tides were at their highest. Italy's prime minister describing it as a blow to the heart of the country. 20 million euros in emergency funds have been approved. New details tonight from investigators looking into the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. A Dutch-led team says a top aide of Vladimir Putin was in contact with the rebel leaders accused of shooting down the aircraft. Nearly 300 people on board were killed when a missile struck the plane over eastern Ukraine in July of 2014. 
Russia's foreign ministry has rejected these latest findings and denies playing any role in the tragedy. The stage is set for a showdown in the U.S. Supreme Court over the power of the president and the release of his tax returns. Donald Trump is asking the court to block prosecutors from getting those returns. His lawyers say it would be unconstitutional, arguing Trump can't be the subject of criminal prosecution while president. A separate emergency application to block House Democrats from his financial records is expected tomorrow. Time for a quick break, but when we come back, a Saskatchewan family finds generosity in grief. Plus... <laughs> a dream come true for a little boy in Alberta. His big birthday surprise ahead on The National. In Regina's airport this week, a really emotional scene. A mother welcoming her adult son with open arms after being separated for nearly four years. They fled war in Syria together. But when most of the family came to Canada as refugees, he was left behind. As Bonnie Allen tells us, it took another family's heartbreak to make this reunion happen. There was so much anticipation. Two mothers, one awaiting her son. The other, who will never see hers again, but helped make this possible. Then they spot him. <laughs> Syrian refugee Abdel Nasser Al Khatib, his wife Hiam, and their two children arrive from Jordan. They're engulfed in hugs as they join the rest of their family in Regina, most settled here as government sponsored refugees in 2016. Finally, is here. You know, we are happy. You, you see, for our family, our family is happy. Uh, very excited this minute. Sharing in their tears, the Regina family who channeled their own grief into generosity. Last year, 25-year-old Jeremy Campbell died while visiting hot springs in Japan. He slipped, hit his head and drowned. Friends offered to raise money to help transport his body home to Saskatchewan. But the family had another idea. It just seemed like the perfect way to honour him to use the money, $23,000, to privately sponsor a Syrian family to come to Canada. It's nice to know that this family is going to be reunited with their younger brother, their youngest brother, and even though I don't have my younger brother. Come right in. The Campbell family teamed up with six Lutheran churches to make the arrangements and to fill this house with furniture, food and clothing. The lead organizer says Abdul Nasser's mother has cried for him almost every day. I think that it has just worn her out with worry about him. And on this night, she has him back in her arms and meets her grandson, Jamal, for the first time. Abdul Nasser says there are no words to describe this moment, but they quickly learn the name Jeremy Campbell and the words, thank you. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. We're going to take a quick break now, but when we come back, four-year-old Chase Olison wished for 100 garbage trucks for his birthday. We'll tell you how his mom made that wish come true, in a way, in our moment. Chase Olison loves garbage trucks. And what's not to love? They have big, loud horns, and they pick up garbage. They're, they're pretty cool. So for his fourth birthday, he asked for 100 of them. <laughs> now, luckily for him, his birthday party fell on garbage day. So his mother emailed the folks at local waste management to ask if the truck could make a quick stop on its route. They replied, they can do better than that. And that is our moment. I couldn't oh believe it. God. It was, it was pretty, pretty cool when we walked out and seen all the street is lined with garbage trucks. Like, there? So push this button right there. That one? Yep. And then we got it, and then we'll pull up. There it goes, you see? It's exciting, you know, letting them use the control and blow the horn. <laughs> the kids have always seemed to love garbage trucks and you know, we're right in there with firefighters and policemen. Okay, <laughs> best birthday ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Let's go, buddy. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Chase. 
<laughs> oh man, I want to do that for my birthday. Uh, you know, I, I, like I still laugh at the fact that he asked for a hundred <laughs> garbage trucks, and 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 of course it is adorable and and absurd that that you could ask for a hundred of anything on your birthday. Until of course you just realize a hundred to a kid that age is 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 more of an idea than a number. And and boy, did that deliver in spades. Just the delight when he pulled the, the horn. <laughs> it's one of the beautiful things about having little kids around. You're living through that now, Andrew. I did uh, a few years ago. And just the wonder of things that you otherwise would take for granted, like the garbage truck going by. Yeah. I spent a lot of time around construction sites with my sons just watching the excavators do their job. And kudos, of course, for the company for uh, providing this fantastic yeah. birthday for him. Yeah, no kidding. That is the National for November the 14th. Good night. Good night.